Hi, everyone. My name is Victoria Vilk. I'm the Program Director for Digital Safety and Free Expression at Parent America. We are a nonprofit that celebrates and defends the written word here in the US and internationally. And I'm joined today by Harlow. I'm going to let Harlow jump in and introduce herself. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Harlow Holmes. I'm the Director of Digital Security at Freedom of the Press Foundation. So welcome to this Social Distancing Social from Future Tense, I love that name, a partnership of Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. A huge thanks from Harlow and I to all of our partners for hosting us and to all of you for taking the time after I'm sure what was a long day to join us. Um, we are going to be leading today a hands-on cyber self-defense workshop. So you're going to want to have your phones available on hand. and. In our work on digital safety, Harlow and I generally work with writers, journalists, and newsrooms. And as the protests against systemic racism and police brutality have swept the nation, we have seen journalists arrested, assaulted, shot with rubber bullets and tear gas, and had their equipment confiscated and damaged. But of course, it is not just journalists who are currently at risk. Most of us have seen the videos of protesters, many of them peaceful, also being arrested and attacked. And the aggressiveness of the response to the protests has really surfaced some very real digital safety concerns around surveillance and privacy that we feel it is absolutely critical for you folks to know about. And so in recognition of the period we're living through, Harlow and I decided at the last minute to pivot this session a little bit and to really focus on digital safety in the context of protests. However, whether or not you are engaging in the protests in any way or can do so, you know, if people have health concerns, they have other reasons why they can't, um, we're confident that much of this information is still going to be useful to you and still things that you're going to want to know about. So what a lot of us don't realize is just how much our cell phones are telling on us to everyone all the time. Uh, in this moment when folks are out protesting, that's not only a privacy problem, it's actually also a security and safety problem. So our plan for today, our agenda, if you will, is first of all to help you figure out if you're going to go to a protest, should you bring your phone? And if you bring it, what are the risks um, that your phone might actually be posing? What are the pitfalls that you should be aware of? That could include your phone being stolen, lost, or confiscated, potentially by law enforcement. It could include your phone sending out signals in real time, identifying you and where you are. And we also want to encourage you to be mindful about post-protest surveillance, which a lot of folks are not aware of, and we'll walk you through what that looks like and how to be more mindful of it. And if we have time, which I hope we will, uh, we'll talk a little bit about tightening your security and privacy settings on your social media accounts on Twitter and Facebook. If we run out of time, we'll do a separate session on that in some other point in the future. But I do have a couple of caveats. The first one is that none of this is foolproof or airtight. We don't have any magic solutions to some of these issues. Our phones and our apps are basically built to track and surveil us in real time. And the government has all kinds of surveillance technology that we don't even know about. So this guidance is really meant to make you aware of risks and vulnerabilities and to help you shore those vulnerabilities up as much as you can. The second caveat is that not everybody has the same concerns and therefore not all the guidance that we're gonna offer will apply to you or even make sense or be relevant to you. you know, whether how you treat your security in protests or anywhere outside depends on whether, let's say you're a journalist or an activist or an organizer, or let's say you are a protester who feels very passionately about the issue, but you're undocumented and you're deeply concerned about your identity being exposed or your status being discovered. So depending on which of those categories you fall into, right, you might have totally different ideas about how you take the information that we're going to share today and apply it in your own life. And that is one of the reasons why folks who work on security, whether it's physical security or digital security, talk about threat modeling. And I'm going to let Harlow explain a little bit what threat modeling is and why it's relevant. So threat modeling is a, uh, it's an information security term, um, but ultimately what it means is uh, uh, compartmentalizing your decision making um, around three to five basic questions, but we'll simplify it here. Um, first off, what is it that you're actually out there pr to protect? Um, by having a concise answer to that question, 
uh, you can actually uh, like, uh, you know, prevent yourself from taking like way too many precautions that don't actually make sense or, you know, um, applying too few precautions, which is actually even worse. And uh, another question that you would ask is like, who am I protecting these things from? Is this going to be, you know, um, a person that I meet on the street um, at this protest? Is this going to be, you know, a three letter agency that I might meet? Is this going to be like cops that, you know, might only briefly enter into my life? Um, so uh, having a concise kind of uh, answer to that question helps a lot. Um, and then ultimately, it all boils down to uh, what resources do, do um, either have in this equation? What resources does this perceived adversary have? And what resource do I have in order to mitigate these particular threats? Um, and so uh, this is a hard question to answer. It's usually like, you know, a combination of time, money, and we can't do anything about your time and money. We can definitely work on uh, um, boosting your skill in order to address these things. Thank you. So we're going to start with the critical question of, do you bring your phone? If you're going out to a protest, or if you're going anywhere where there is um, a security concern, a safety concern, a privacy concern, and I'm going to ask Harlow to talk us through the kinds of signals that our phones are sending out literally every second in real time without us even knowing about them in many cases, which it's actually critical we know about. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, when we were thinking, when we were um, bringing up threat modeling just before, uh, we actually want to kind of think about yourselves once again in like three different categories. As Victoria says, some will apply to you, you might identify with those, some you might not. Um, but uh, this, uh, a person who might bring their phone is a person who is, you know, like a, a public journalist, someone who is out there um, ultimately to witness, to broadcast, whose identity is, is known because it's also tied to your, your professional work um, and it's tied to this event. So um, that said, there's also people who um, might want to prepare, or sorry, might want to bring a separate phone, um, one that does not, um, uh, that is not automatically tied to so much of like, you know, their digital life. And then there might be people for reasons that Victoria outlined might not bring their phone at all or any phone at all. Um, so the reason why phones are such like a nexus point for this particular question has to do with the fact that phones broadcast a lot of information all the time. Um, just for, for um, background, a phone has a couple of radios on them. They have upwards of three separate radios on them. One being the radio that uh, lets the phone behave like it's a phone, meaning uh, that's the radio that allows you to uh, send and receive text messages, make and receive phone calls that interact with cell phone towers. But then there's other radios. There are your Wi-Fi radios, right, which is what you use to um, connect to uh, the internet. Uh, via Wi-Fi and uh, otherwise known as access points. Um, and then there's also uh, Bluetooth, which is for very, very close, uh, you know, kind of near field communication um, that is like more proximity based. Uh, and so uh, Bluetooth uh, is what uh, is the radio that allows you to communicate with your earbuds or with even uh, with your smartwatch or even like, you know, kiosks that you might see on the street as you walk through. Right, which is all to say that if, what that means in practice, though, is that uh, your phone could be locating you in a particular place at a particular time in real time to law enforcement or to other agencies and connecting it to your name, right, or to your identity. So that's something that a lot of us don't know but need, need to be aware of. And so the question is, okay, do you leave your smartphone at home? For some people, that is not actually that hard to do, right? Depends on what you're out are trying to achieve. But if you need your smartphone to communicate with people, to organize, et cetera, you need a phone for text messaging, for whatever, you could bring something that is like a dummy or a burner phone that is basically clean and it just has some of the very basic stuff you need on it to communicate. Or if you're gonna bring your smartphone, you have to do some prep work to it and we're gonna walk you through that in detail, right? Things that you need to know about how to protect your smart mode if you're gonna bring it. But again, a burner or a dummy phone could work for some people and I'll just have Harlow explain what exactly a burner phone is. I think Harlow might be frozen. So, oh, there she's back. Yep, sorry. 
It says my, in, my connection to the internet is unstable. Great, during a webinar, what could go wrong? <laughs> um, well, in this scenario, we might just have to turn off your camera and that way you can at least hear yeah. your um, So talk me through a burner phone. What's a burner phone? Okay, um, so a burner phone um, is, uh, well, a lot of people when they hear the term burner phone, they think of you know uh, something that they saw in the wire or something like that. Um, but ultimately what it is, is it's not, it, it's a, a, a phone that has been prepared um, in a certain way in order to get, help you get your work done. So you want to be able to, you know, like re record, take photographs, report, file, et cetera, but you don't necessarily want it to be connected to your entire life's, let's say Gmail history or um, text correspondence with your friends and family, you know, like personal photos, things like that. Um, so uh, another upside to it is that in the event that your burner phone is either seized or um, possibly uh, damaged and destroyed, uh, the um, harm that's done to you is uh, entirely minimized. Great. So not everyone can afford a burner phone. Not everyone wants to deal with a burner phone. Some people are very attached to their smartphones. So if you're going to bring your smartphone, we're going to walk you through some things you need to keep in mind. So how to protect yourself from your own smartphone. This is a checklist. Um, we are going to walk through each of these things in detail. I only put it up in case anybody is feeling really industrious and they want to take a screenshot because they want to remember some of the things they need to think about before they leave their house if they're going to go participate in a protest or, or in any place where they're kind of concerned about being located or their identity. Um, so we're going to walk you through those things. Some of these you could potentially do now. Some of them you won't need to do now. You will need to do before you, you know, in the right context. And some of them I don't recommend you rush because if you mess them up, you might create a headache for yourself. So we'll kind of talk through it as we go along. So step one, this might seem obvious, but I'm going to say it. Back up your phone, right? If you're in a situation where your phone is broken or destroyed or confiscated, uh, you want to have the core stuff that you need on your phone at your disposal. And so in each of these slides, we're going to show you on an iPhone what the pathway is so that at least you can find it so you know where it is next time. And we tried to do that for Androids, but as all of you know, Androids vary wildly. So if it's not exactly where we say it is in your Android, it's probably because your Android has slightly different settings than the Android we checked out. So just you might have to fish around a little bit or just Google it. But um, back up your phone. But the question is, do you do it locally, like on a computer or something in your house, or do you do it in the cloud? And I'm going to let Harlow kind of address what are the pros and cons of those two options. Sure. So, um, like most of us, we um, automatically do, when we set up our phone, um, associate it to our iCloud or to Google Drive. And that can be fine because there are certain situations where you definitely want to make sure that when you get a new phone, um, you automatically have your contacts ready to go or you automatically have those photos of yours that are so precious to you in the cloud someplace safe. Um, however, uh, let's just um, be mindful of the fact that there are certain properties in both iCloud and in Google Drive that are um, ultimately subpoenable. Um, things like photos, things like contacts are not end-to-end -end encrypted when they're in the cloud. And so that does, and even things like iMessages. Um, so that does mean to a certain extent, there are certain properties, certain assets of yours that can be available via subpoena. Um, and so in which case you might want to um, do uh, introduce local backups, which can be performed on, um, as Victoria says, on your computer locally, um, you know, put onto a, uh, like a hard drive uh, for things that are a little bit more precious to you, if that is of concern. Uh, personally, I like to do a combination of both. Great. And I should say, we are mostly going to address questions at the end. I'm paying attention to the questions. I'm actually happy to address all the questions that I'm seeing, but I'm going to save some of them for the end. And if there's one that's directly about the thing that we're talking about, I'll jump in in the middle. But I want you to know that if I'm not answering them now, I see them and we'll get to them. Next step is to make sure that your phone is encrypted. Uh, and I'm going to have um, Harlow jump in and explain what encryption means and what it is in terms of the data on your phone. And then we can talk you through on different devices how that could work. Mm -hmm. um, so what encryption means, and by which we mean full disk encryption, uh, this means that when your phone is powered off, 
uh, its entire contents are essentially scrambled. And this is great because when you're, if someone else has access to your phone, they cannot easily, um, you know, open it up and see what the contents are, nor can they do things like modify the contents, i.e. putting software on it behind your back that you don't know about. And so uh, this is actually kind of essential. Uh, it's not only for protests that you want to encrypt your phone. It's just something that you do if, uh, you know, uh, you would love to have turned on if you lost your phone in a cab or if you have kids in your house who, you know, are mischievous or anything like that. So um, the first step to protecting a phone is to make sure that full disk encryption is enabled. And the cool thing is, is that uh, iPhones actually for a very long time have come out of the box, uh, come uh, encrypted out of the box, so you don't even have to worry about it. For Android, most newer Androids are also encrypted out of the box, but it always makes sure to check depending on your model. And so uh, this slide displays exactly how you can do that. Once again, your mileage may vary per phone that you have. Thank you, Harla. All right, so folks took a look at where on Android in particular, they can double check that their phone is encrypted. Now here we're gonna get into some of the nitty gritty and this is where things get a little bit complicated and a little bit nuanced. Um, I would encourage you to be at least a little bit wary of Face ID and Touch ID. I'm not telling you not to use it and we'll walk you through pros and cons of using it or not using it. Let me, let me help back up and say one thing. The single best thing you can do to protect your phone is to create a long and complex passcode. You know, most of us have some kind of passcode set up on our phone. It's usually four digits. Um, and uh, when I set up, like Harlow is a friend of mine and I go to her when I'm trying to figure out if I'm doing the right thing in terms of cybersecurity. And I was like with great pride told Harlow that I had changed my code to six uh, numbers. And she totally burst my bubble and said that that was not anywhere near good enough. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then she explained to me why, which she's going to explain to all of you, because it was a revelation for me. So, Well, I mean, um, so uh, the default passcode of six digits that you're usually like guided towards when you initiate a new iPhone is not sufficient. Uh, the reason why, um, and this is only if your phone is seized, but the reason why is because um, law enforcement agencies have access to, uh, you know, certain devices that actually um, leverage the fact that uh, you know, they can churn through six com combinations of six numbers um, while uh, unlocking a phone fairly easily. And so the longer and more complex your passphrase is, the more of a fighting chance, we like to say, you're giving your phone um, for resisting this type of brute forcing attack. And so the reason I say be a little bit wary of Touch ID and Face ID is because technically and legally, if you are asked by law enforcement or by anybody else, frankly, to unlock your phone, you are not required to do so without a warrant. You do not have to hold your face up to your phone. You don't have to hold your finger up to your phone. You don't have to enter your passcode. Law enforcement is required to have a warrant to go into your phone. And in order to have a warrant, they have to have a reasonable suspicion that you are doing something wrong. Uh, however, in practice, it can be easier to intimidate someone into using their face or their finger to open their phone than it is to get them to say their very, very long, very complicated passcode out loud. And so some folks have been recommending, if you look at like cheat sheets on cybersecurity and digital safety and protest, some folks have been re recommending uh, turning off Face ID and Touch ID, having a very, very long passcode. So the very long password, passcode part, I'm 100% on board with. Personally, I'm also more comfortable turning off my face and touch ID. However, if you think about practically speaking, how annoying that could be if you're like out somewhere, right? And you're trying to put in a 10 multi-letter, multi-number passcode, um, obviously it's a lot easier if you have touch or face ID. So you can do several different things. Um, you can, first of all, remember that at least your video and your photos, you can access even when your phone is locked, usually by swiping from the right to the left on iPhones. And I think Androids have similar shortcuts. So if you need to get to that part of your phone, which a lot of folks have been using, you can do that. Um, the other option is something that Harlow just taught me, which is essentially, Harlow, can you explain it? It's like lockdown. Yeah. Mode. 
Yeah, lockdown mode. Um, so this is a gesture that most phones have uh, that actually clear your biometrics uh, from its local cache. And so what that means is that um, if you find yourself under duress, you perform this little maneuver. And then the next time you want to open up your phone again, you have to enter that complex passcode. And so um, this is what I uh, do usually, like when I'm walking around and things are normal and I feel safe and, and uh, you know, like nimble, um, I do have my biometrics on. But I've also practiced the um, gesture for my phone in order to enable lock mode. And I even have it timed down to, you know, how many seconds it will take me to do so. So if I ever feel, you know, like clouds looming or whatever, um, then uh, I know that it's, if it's time to enable lockdown mode in order to clear the face ID, I have that option. Right. And as a kind of another layer of security, if you're looking at least on an iPhone, and I think it's in a similar place in Android, where you've got face ID or passcode or whatever that part of your phone is, you know, I think it's older phones, it's touch ID and passcode. Um, you can scroll down and there's a section called allow access when locked, and it has a bunch of toggles. And uh, the things to really pay attention to in that section, so that that stuff that your phone, even when locked, one could actually get to, even if you've got your passcode on. One thing is to turn off USB accessories, and another thing is to turn on erase data. And Harlow's going to walk you through what each of those things implicate, right? So if you turn off USB accessories and you turn on erase data, what is the point of that? Why would you bother doing that? Um, the reason why is, uh, well, there, for the two different features, one has to do with the um, prospect that if your phone is seized and someone plugs in a, a device into your phone, um, then uh, they are, uh, I guess, prevented from interacting with that phone as a live device. Um, ultimately, what it does is it means that if ever your phone is, um, is locked and something is uh, stuck into it via USB, uh, then it can only draw power. Um, and so, and for erase data, the point of that um, is that if uh, you do find yourself in a, uh, in a situation where someone is trying to get into your, pass for, uh, your, your phone using like a variety of passphrases in order to guess it, um, your phone will be essentially uh, a factory reset after 10 bad tries. And it wipes all that data. All right. So one thing I've seen a lot of in cheat sheets and guides around cybersecurity in this moment is a recommendation that people turn off location tracking on their phones. And I was very diligently doing that. And again, we had one of those moments where I bragged to Harlow about how good I was about my cybersecurity and then Harlow- It's good, it is good. Yeah, and you're gonna explain why it's good, but also why you shouldn't let it give you a false sense of security like the one I had when I was diligently turning off my location. We're not telling you not to turn off your location at all. It's just important to understand what it does and doesn't get you. Yes, exactly. Um, once again, we want people to have practical advice um, and not mythological advice. So um, ultimately, a phone is a phone is a phone. And when you have a phone in your pocket, it is going to interact with a variety of services in order to behave as a phone and in order to, to please you being a phone. So um, that means that your phone always knows what cell towers it's seeing. Um, and that information might be recorded by your telephone company. Um, if you have a smartphone, uh, and our, the, our lesson is definitely tailored towards smartphones, um, a smartphone might ask Apple and Google, or it might tell Apple and Google, you know, like a certain conditions about your environment that aren't necessarily like attached to your Google profile or saved in your Apple ID, but it is information that Apple and Google do have as a company. And so um, the reason why um, in this slide, we're showing you like, you know, the, where these settings are, they're located in the privacy section. And what that means is that it definitely like limiting um, your apps, like, you know, your Yelp and Uber and, you know, that game of Sudoku that you for some reason downloaded, limiting their access to your location services definitely does um, protect you as like a consumer from a privacy standpoint, but um, you have to go through ex ex exorbitant lengths in order to actually protect your location from these players. Um, and ultimately, it's more likely that uh, in the event of something 
horribly, horribly gone wrong, uh, that a law enforcement agency will, um, you know, like issue a warrant to Google or Apple for this um, granular location data, than it is that they will like, you know, go to Yelp and say like, oh, you know, who is giving the Yelp review at this time on the street corner. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're pruning your location services. Thank you, Marla. Arguably, more importantly than turning off your location, although by all means, feel free to do that, is to actually turn off notifications, like the, the pop-ups, you know, that come down on your phone. Because if you have gone through the effort of creating a very long password, and you've gone through the effort of making sure that your phone is locked uh, and encrypted, but if you've got little notifications popping up with all of the information that people are, you know, sending you or texting with you, uh, that kind of is only your attempts to uh, keep your information private only gets you so far. So we walk you through again on iPhone, you go into notifications and you can, uh, it says set show previews to when unlocked or never. So basically you're never gonna have previews. And again, it's easy to toggle this stuff on and off when you're, and there are moments when you're gonna need that to be the case. There are moments when you don't need that to be the case. In Android, there's more nuance in terms of what you can actually achieve. And um, again, I'll hand over to Harlow to talk about the fact that in Android, you can fine tune it some. You can fine tune it in iPhone too, uh, but Android, I think Android has a setting that uh, iPhone doesn't. Yes, um, so in both of these platforms, uh, Per app, you can say um, what types of notifications get shown up. And then there's also going to be certain apps that give you even more granular control. So um, I'll take a signal, I guess, as uh, an example. Um, within Signal, you actually have, within the notifications, you have the option to show someone's name and the entire content of their message, someone's name only, and also um, just a, blank, a plain notification that says someone is pinging you on Signal. Um, and the reason why this is important is because um, as we talk about like, you know, the different apps that you can use to communicate, the different things that you might use when you're out and, you know, like, um, organizing um, or coordinating with with your team. Um, ultimately, if someone takes your phone and even if it's locked, you get the bubble that pops up and says like so and so says let's meet on the corner of fifth and third. Um, that ultimately um, will not prevent someone from reading that. And uh, one of my favorite anecdotes, uh, I won't name names, but uh, you know, uh, like it's entirely possible that someone will grab your phone um, not unlock it at all, but just wait for those notifications to pop up and then just like place it face down on a copy machine. And that's how, you know, your correspondence gets entered into an evidence locker. So um, this is why um, just like going through the variety of notification settings that you have on whatever phone that you have um, really, really makes all the difference, even if you are applying the best end-to-end -end encryption communications. Thank you, Harlow. I think before we move on to the next section, I'm going to flag some of the questions that oh, great. are directly yeah. connected to what we've been talking about. That's some of the great. questions we're actually going to answer in a little bit, so I might hold off on those. And if we still haven't answered them, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to them. I'll, I'll make an effort not to leave out anybody's questions. So um, we've got someone who says, let me see. Oh, Harlow mentioned law enforcement has ways to crack six-digit encryptions or six-digit passcodes, I think is probably what that was intended to say, but I'm not sure. Um, was this after 24, the 2015 San Bernardino attack? I thought Apple refused or could not help law enforcement unlock phones. Has this changed? Um, so, uh, the, so actually that was back in the day when it was four-digit passcodes. Um, and uh, ultimately, what happened with that case is, yes, Apple refused to um, uh, defeat their own technologies in order to allow the FBI to open up that phone. Um, the FBI then followed up with, uh, um, you know, a statement saying, well, you know what? Never mind, Apple, we got it some other way. Now, um, the details have yet to come out or yet to be like entirely publicized, but we do in the information security community believe that the FBI um, uh, um, worked with a, for a digital forensics company that specializes in creating um, a, a combination of exploits that take advantage of flaws within the iPhone of that day, that model that um, the perpetrator had uh, in order to um, abuse uh, the fact that it was like a, a 
kind of trivial passcode and other flaws that were present in that particular iPhone. So um, there, uh, this is, um, uh, you know, just kind of the way that it works in very, very high profile, very serious cases where um, law enforcement absolutely wants this particular uh, device to be opened. Um, if they cannot go through the manufacturer, they will go to companies that make these uh, type of exploit chains in order to get exactly what they want. Um, and so this is why we can say what goes on in the future, maybe like next year when we're talking about this very same thing, I'll be like, well, you know what? Now we're doing 14 <laughs> <laughs> digits and then Victoria is going to cry. Um, and I'm sorry. And scream. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, uh, but uh, it is a little bit of a cat and mouse game and this is where we are right now. Mm -hmm. I think some of the other questions I'm seeing are a little bit technical, so I think I'm gonna save them for the end, but they're seen, okay. we will address them, I promise. All right, so let's say you decided you're gonna bring your smartphone. You've done some of the steps in terms of turning off your notifications, making sure it's backed up, making sure it's encrypted, uh, making sure it's got a long passcode. Some things to keep in mind while you're actually out and about. Again, I'm going to give you a checklist on the off chance that you're super diligent and want to have a screenshot of it, but then we're going to walk you through all of these things in detail. So these are all things to consider when you're out and about with your phone. Step one, if you can keep your phone off a good chunk of the time, that's probably the safest bet. Maybe you only turn it on when you need to kind of figure out where you're going or if you're meeting up with somebody. Um, or you want to take a photo or a video, but overall you could keep your phone off. That's not practical for everybody. So a piece of advice that's been circulating pretty actively is to turn off airplane mode, which is a very good idea. You know, all you have to do on most phones to turn off airplane mode is swipe from the, you know, from the top or diagonally, click a button, you've turned on airplane mode. That's great. The only issue is that, do you remember how Carl, Harlow was saying that there are three signals that your phone could, or radios that your phone is using, right? It's Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and also your kind of cell phone signal. Airplane mode addresses only one of those three things. So again, you don't want to have a false sense of security if you turn on airplane mode. And I'll um, hand it over to Harlow to talk about some of the other things you have to do in order to get the kind of security that you think that you have when you turn off, turn off airplane mode, turn on, sorry, airplane mode. Sorry, can you repeat that last bit? I, um, my internet was having problems again. Totally. So I was explaining why airplane mode can give you a false sense of security and I ah, was yes. going over to you to talk through the other um, things you need to adjust in order to actually have that security. Yes. So as Victoria said, um, we talked about the other radios and if you've ever actually used airplane mode on an airplane, but are still listening to Spotify, you might notice that Bluetooth is still available. It depends on the type of uh, phone that you have. Some phones allow for this, some phones don't, but uh, don't take for granted that airplane mode is going to um, stop all of the radios from communicating. Um, so in which case you also, if you do want to protect yourself from um, you know, pinging out not only your um, subscriber ID via airplane mode, but also pinging out, you know, um, information about your Wi-Fi address or your Bluetooth connections, then you uh, also want to um, go through the settings specifically, not the shortcuts, but the settings in order to turn those off. And the reason why we say do it in settings rather than relying on the shortcuts, like the control panel or whatever, um, is because uh, those are actually lying to you a little bit. Um, they don't necessarily turn off those radios, but they just put them in passive mode and they're still kind of doing their thing. And so one thing Harlow recommends if you don't want to bother turning all those settings off, although truly it's not very hard once you know where they are and what you need to do, um, is to get something called a Faraday bag, which effectively blocks um, your phone from communicating with the, or sending out signals and receiving signals uh, that all three kinds of signals, basically. So you pop your phone in there, take it out when you need it, pop it back in, yep. which is That's not for easy, everything, but uh, is in some ways more convenient for some folks. It is a cost that you incur, but um, it is the easiest way to make sure that you're uh, doing all of this correctly without actually having to think about it. And especially if you find yourself in duress situations, then yeah, that's your best bet. So 
in an ideal world, I mean, I should say that you should assume that any communications you're sending out and around are likely able to be intercepted or being intercepted, right? Folks have the technology to be able to intercept those communications, which is why if you do need to communicate with someone, in an ideal world, what you should be doing is to use end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps. And uh, the one that's kind of the gold standard that people recommend is Signal. WhatsApp is also end-to-end -end encrypted, but it's also owned by Facebook. So how you feel about WhatsApp and using WhatsApp depends a little bit on how you feel about Facebook. Although again, it is end-to-end -end encrypted. And I'll have Harlow explain that in a second. Um, what you don't want to do, well, I should, let me just say one thing. If you're going to use Signal or WhatsApp effectively, you have to make sure that both parties have it, right? You've got to cajole somebody into downloading Signal. You've got to do it yourself. You've got to cajole somebody else into doing it. If you get enough of your friends on it, it becomes a lot easier, which is something that both Harlow and I have been doing. Uh, but you do want to be mindful of iMessage. And so first I'll let Harlow explain kind of what end-to-end -end encryption is in relation to messaging. And then um, she can talk through why iMessage is something you need to be really careful with. I could if my internet worked. Do you want me to do it? We can hear you. I'll jump in and when Harlow's back. I'm back. She's back. Yes, I apologize, having a very bad day on the internet. Um, so, end-to-end uh, -end encryption is the principle that um, the only parties that can actually read uh, any content that's going between those two parties uh, are those two parties. Um, unlike, let's say, Facebook or a chat over Google or something like that, um, when that, yes, your connection to that service is encrypted to that service, but that service still does have its own copy of the things that you say, and that could be used against you in the case of, um, you know, like a subpoena or hacking or, or any other types of things that could go wrong. Um, so as Victoria said, uh, right now the gold standard are things that are made with the Signal protocol, which includes Signal WhatsApp, and to a certain extent, although not entirely, inspired by the Signal protocol, Wire. And there are a couple of other apps that have the same qualities. Um, iMessage is also end-to-end -end encrypted. However, iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted only between iMessage partners. And if you remember, um, Victoria said that in order to have this end-to-end -end encryption, uh, everybody has to be using the same app. They have to be speaking the same language. Um, and so if you've ever used an iMessage, um, uh, or if you've ever tried to send an iMessage to someone who, let's say, is on an Android, you might notice that instead of getting a blue bubble, you get a green bubble. And that means that um, instead of having end-to-end -end encryption, what iMessage is doing is it's sending that same message over SMS. And that is SMS messages or text messages are the most unsafe ways of communicating with people. They are heavily surveilled. Um, they are also easily, trivially hackable. Uh, I'm not going to get into the weeds about this, but it can be surveilled, it can be hacked, and it is absolutely not safe. Um, and so what makes iMessage problematic um, is that you might find yourself in a situation where um, you are talking to an Android person and you don't necessarily realize it until the bubble pops up as green. Or more likely, um, you might find yourself in a place where uh, your connectivity to the iMessage service is interrupted and then um, because iMessage can't be reached, it'll just send it to your iPhone friend as a text message. And so in order to avoid this confusion that could be possibly dangerous, um, uh, we uh, you know, like, uh, use iMessage, but with that caveat in mind. So the other thing we wanna draw your attention to is post-protest surveillance. And what that means is basically, um, Essentially, there are roomfuls of folks in law enforcement and various agencies that look through people's public social media posts and their live streams and use those to identify the faces of people uh, out and about protesting. And uh, a lot of folks don't realize that by live streaming or by, you know, posting zillions of photos of other protesters, including their faces up close, that they could be putting those people at risk. And so we feel like it's important, it's an important thing to know. 
it also could put you at risk. So if, for example, let's say you are a journalist with a public profile or somebody who just doesn't want a whole bunch of people they don't know to know where you live, right? You want to make sure that if you're photoing or videoing next to your own house, you are not including the intersection of your street or your front door. And if it sounds like I'm being absurd, I can tell you that in the last several months, I've been on uh, Zoom webinars where people have inadvertently revealed their cell phones and their addresses and a whole bunch of other personal information that they didn't mean to reveal. So I do actually encourage you to be mindful in this kind of hyper virtual era that we're all in now about what you might inadvertently be exposing yourself to. You know, there are cases of doxing, there are cases of stalking. These are all things that you don't want um, to make yourself more vulnerable to. Like I said, it's also important to be more mindful of uh, exposing somebody else's identity inadvertently without intending to do them any harm. So we encourage folks to request permission when possible. If you're taking a close-up shot of somebody, ask them if it's okay before you post it. And truly think twice about live streaming. Harlow, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, um, so, uh... I mean, ultimately, um, as journalists, uh, your mandate is to uh, record what you see and to tell that story of what you saw. Um, but that said, uh, especially as far as like live streaming is concerned, um, when you live stream to a platform, what you post becomes essentially user generated content. And quite frankly, um, different law enforcement agencies, if you go to any police department, they just have a room of people who sit there and follow hashtags on major platforms looking for photos that they can then use and pick apart in terms of the visual information that they see in order to like place that into photo, uh, vi uh, sorry, um, facial recognition databases, uh, tattoo databases. There was actually um, a, yesterday, there was an amazing story that came out um, about uh, the work done to find uh, this woman who uh, was um, uh, a, a she was vandalizing a cop car and they found her via a t-shirt that she bought on Etsy and then through like a cascading, uh, like an acrobatic cascade of subpoenas, found exactly who she was based off of this t-shirt that she bought off of Etsy that was part of a photo that was published in a, um, um, in a journalist's, uh, you know, like social media presence. So uh, that said, you know, like um, we're not here to uh, talk to you about the, um, your ethical mandate um, as journalists, not at all. Uh, you innately know these things, but we just want to remind you what is technically possible as you make these decisions. I want to actually jump in here and say a couple of things. Um, you know, I know that not all the folks on the call are journalists, and I've, I saw a question that uh, isn't in the Q&A anymore, but I actually think it's, it's a valid and important thing to explain. You know, folks have asked when, when, we're kind of trying to share this information. Well, you know, if you're not breaking the law, if you're not rioting or looting, why should you have to hide your identity, right? And I think it's really important to understand several things. Every single one of us in the United States has a constitutional right to protest. There is nothing criminal or wrong or bad about protesting. It's actually our civic duty. The issue is that we have noticed over many years that protest is sometimes treated, not infrequently by law enforcement agencies as a criminal activity. And moreover, people who are, belong to certain uh, demographic backgrounds, namely people of color, are disproportionately subjected to surveillance, to abuse, um, to being trailed and tracked and accused of things that they didn't do and had nothing to do with. And so we wanna make sure that if we are being, in our opinion, uh, egregiously and disproportionately surveilled if our privacy is being violated and in some cases our constitutional right to protest is being treated as a criminal act that we are armed with resources to make decisions that keep us safe so i just wanted to make that clear like harlow and i aren't here to try to tell you how to get you know how to break laws or do things wrong without people finding out we don't believe that you should be doing that. We strongly discourage you from doing that. And you might actually get in trouble or guess, get arrested if you do. And that's, that's how the law works. The problem is the law doesn't always work the way it's supposed to do. And so you should be aware if you are being surveilled and could potentially be connected to times or places or things that you had nothing to do with. And if you are more vulnerable to those sorts of um, 
kind of incursions. So I just wanted to be totally clear about that because I did see folks kind of chatting about it or asking about it. And so I wanted to explain, I don't want to speak for Harlow, I'm speaking from my position. And I don't know if Harlow wants to jump in or add anything. But I will also say that Harlow and I often work internationally with journalists who are at great risk from their state. And so they really do need to understand, and that's true sometimes here too, they need to understand the things that they have to do to keep themselves safer while still doing their job or exercising their civic duty. No, that's well said. Sorry if I got a little high horsey, but I just that's okay. That's okay. I also love to do a good rant from time to time. Let it out. I agree 100%. Thank you. Um, so on that note, uh, if you are taking photos of people, I would encourage you, especially if you don't have their permission to do so, encourage you to consider blurring faces and watching out for metadata. We've seen some questions about metadata. I don't know if there have been any questions about blurring faces, but I'll let Harlow uh, take this one and explain um, both tricks around blurring faces and why you might do it, and also tricks around stripping metadata. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I like to kind of preface, preface this by saying that um, photographs or you know digital images have uh, two parts to them. Uh, similar to when images were analog, you have the, the visual part that you see, like the glossy part of the photo. And then on the back, you have that matte part that's just printed with like, you know, the time that the Walmart printed it out on their printer. And that's metadata. But both of these things have to be taken into account, um, especially when you're sharing sensitive images. So on that front part, you might want to blur people's faces and um, not all blurring techniques or obfuscation techniques are created equal. Um, there, are, um, there are iPhone shortcuts, for instance, that might assist you in, you know, like finding faces within a photo, um, either blurring them or redacting them. Um, there's a really, really great app called uh, ObscuraCam, by, uh, which is for Android, um, that does a similar, similar thing and actually Signal now allows you to blur faces. They do it in a very, very elegant way that isn't um, easily re, um, re uh, or sorry, like um, undone, uh, which is great. Um, but then if you want to take care of the metadata, and I do see a question in here about how, um, you know, uh, meta, how to make metadata go away. Um, ultimately, the easiest way of doing that is to replace that image that you post with a copy of it that you make yourself. And the easiest thing to do is to screenshot it instead of like posting that photo, um, taking a screenshot of the photo and then that metadata is supplanted by, you know, the metadata of the screenshot, which is perfectly or should be perfectly innocuous. Um, also do know that Signal in itself um, is, an, is the only app that allows for end-to-end -end encryption that also will redact the metadata from photos not everything that you send but it will redact from photos and uh, that's great uh, because um, you can uh, you know like you don't have to think you don't have to go through too many steps in order to like automatically scrub metadata and also um, you could use the notes to self feature which is in signal in order to like you know just take photos without metadata that you save for yourself for later. But you could also, if I understood correctly, basically use Signal to text a photo to yourself and thereby stripping it of metadata. Yes, yeah. And, and that is that. Yep. So like you, we're trying to give you like, we understand that if we give you some guidance that's incredibly impractical and time consuming, the chances that you do it are slimmer. So um, a screenshot or better yet running a photo through Signal quickly will actually strip the metadata uh, in a really quick and easy way for you. And this goes for photos. It doesn't, unfortunately, not yet go for video. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we have, this is just our last slide, and then we're going to delve into Q&A, which we see a lot of really, really good questions here. Um, this is not a technical point. This is just a safety point. If you're going out and engaging in protests or marches, um, write down some phone numbers on your arm or on a piece of paper somewhere. Most of us don't have our emergency contacts necessarily memorized, some of us might, but you also might consider um, a lawyer, like finding a local legal aid uh, facility. If you are a reporter, you can write down the phone number for the committee to, um, the reporters committee, uh, sorry, Harlow, I just blank, reporters committee. Um, for, free, for free press. Yes, 
our CFP, I always call them by their acronym, they have a legal 24-7 legal hotline, but make sure you have some numbers written on you somewhere or on a piece of paper on you somewhere that you could call if you get separated from your phone and you need help. So that's my last point. Um, Harlow, do you have any last points you want to make before we delve headfirst into Q&A? Um, no, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. You can, if you want, you can start. Okay. Um, I should go in there and pull out questions. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll start from the bottom, actually, or, or towards the bottom. Um, so uh, a lot of these actually fall outside of the realm of, of mobile. And so I'm going to take a couple of mobile questions. Can I ask you to not read the person, but read the question out loud, just in case sure, sure. the live stream or otherwise can know what it is? Okay, um, so we did cover the one about the strategy for locking up phones with a password or a fingerprint reader or whatever, and which is the safest. And we can't really tell you what is the safest, but I hope that we definitely um, addressed your questions about uh, the options that you have and ultimately um, make that work for you. I think that that is the most, uh, um, the most important thing to practice what works best for you. Um, so you'll need it in, in cases where it actually counts. Um, another person asks about uh, using, um, instead of using smartphones, using uh, what they like to call feature phones, I guess, things that don't necessarily, oh no, a feature phone would have GPS. I guess you're thinking about a, a quote unquote dumb phone, that's what we used to call the old phones, that don't have GPS and do nothing but calls and simple text messages. Um, and you know, buying them in cash and activating them quote unquote anonymously. Um, I would actually, I mean, so um, we can only give you options and we can only give you technical advice. Um, I personally don't recommend um, going with a, uh, a phone that doesn't have certain capabilities for certain reasons. Uh, we did discuss the fact that phone calls and text messages that go over cell towers are entirely surveillable. And so you do want to have a phone that is capable of providing extra protection and not having to speak in ridiculous codes and, and things like that. Um, and also um, it's in, while it is definitely possible to buy things, um, to buy um, phones and to activate them anonymously, uh, it's not something that I mean, we're not going to give you advice about, um, you know, how to, we want to give you advice that is above board that works rather than giving you advice that might get you into serious trouble if you make one mistake. Um, and the mistakes are many given the amount of surveillance that our country and all countries, quite frankly, are under. So that's my answer to that. Hello, um, let me just see. Somebody asked, actually, I, I keep all connected devices, you know, phone included, on VPN all the time. Thoughts on this practice. So do you mind just explaining what VPN is and then sharing sure. your thoughts on that practice? <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, that's a great question. Um, a VPN is a virtual private network. And what it means is it creates an encrypted tunnel uh, between your device and a server somewhere else that you subscribe to that pretty much like does the internetting for you, as I like to say. Um, and so this is great because uh, instead of letting um, your telephone company know or you know, your internet provider know, um, or even like the person who owns the Wi-Fi know exactly what websites you're looking at, um, if you're on Signal or if you're on WhatsApp or like whatever. Um, all they know is that you're connected to a VPN and they really, really can't do anything about it if you have a good VPN by your side. So um, I actually do recommend this. And um, if we're gonna take it, to, uh, so like, once again, everything takes practice um, and a little bit of exploration. So I'm not gonna say like, go out and like, you know, just choose a VPN and put it on and off you go. Um, ultimately, I do want people to like shop around and be like consumers um, or like put on your consumer cap as you're shopping for the VPN that works for you. Um, but uh, just um, to bring it back to like the scenario that we're spending time on, um, it even if you are using Signal, even if you are using WhatsApp, right, you still go out there and everyone knows that you are on Signal because your phone, if they can see what's going on on the network, whether you're on somebody else's Wi-Fi or if you're connected to a Stingray, we didn't talk about that um, too much, but, or, you know, if someone has access to um, the radio signals in the air, 
they will know that your phone is contacting Signal in order to exchange a message. So the only way to thwart that is to have a VPN on your mobile phone. So yeah. Um, and I will just say, I think that Har I want to emphasize the point Harlow was making that not all VPNs are created equal. Some of them are shady uh, yeah. and could actually be putting your security and safety at risk and tracking you and selling what you're doing downstream. So you really do want to make sure that you pick uh, a VPN that's tried and tested. And there are some really good articles from, you know, Wirecutter and other um, digital outlets that talk, talk you through like what's a good VPN and what's not a good VPN. Let me see. What else do we have? I mean, I think we could tackle some of the questions that are more computer based. I'm, I'm really interested in this question. Um, I've read that especially investigative journalists should, when working on a sensitive story, remove the microphone, camera and Bluetooth from their computer. Do you agree? Um, well, uh, there is, so what we're talking about here is an air gap meaning you don't want a computer that is connected to the internet or otherwise have any choice, any way of transmitting data um, to someone who might like uh, get to your story. Um, so yes, if you are working on something that is so sensitive that it requires an air-gapped computer, you can totally rip out the microphone, camera, and Bluetooth, and also Wi-Fi. The Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi are usually on the same chip, by the way. Um, go ahead and destroy your computer and just know that you will never use that computer normally again. <laughs> um, but that is, and those, um, those scenarios exist. Absolutely. Um, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, I would say like 30% of my work is working with journalists who are doing it, those exact things. Um, that said, there are easier ways of, doing, of going about this that don't require destroying your computer. Um, if you want to uh, have a look at this really cool project called Tails, um, which uh, is a uh, operating system that's built for more sensitive purposes that lives on a USB stick. So instead of turning on your computer and booting into Windows or whatever, you can um, pop in this USB stick, turn on your computer, boot into this USB stick, and then you have a space in order to like disconnect it to the internet, like, you know, do your, your typing, put your notes to upload, or not upload, but like, um, uh, pop in your source interviews and stuff like that. That's a really, really um, feasible solution. Um, otherwise, if you're not going to go that far and you're really just worried about your privacy, um, have a look at like why, like maybe don't write your sensitive story in Google Docs because Google Docs, uh, Google will read your Google Docs. Um, there have been uh, plenty of, or not plenty of, but there have been cases in which um, someone was working on a story that was so, um, uh, let's say, spicy. Uh, that it flagged Google and Google locked them out of their own story because they thought that the subject matter was inappropriate or illegal um, and they had to flag the user. Um, if you are curious and you look at like the bottom right hand corner of your uh, Google Doc that you're working on and you have that little explore star, you click on that and machine learning processes reveal to you about what Google knows about the content that you're writing. And so um, you don't even have to click that button for that to happen. They're already doing that on every single document you, you, you put there. Um, but that's just an interesting um, view into uh, what they're actually doing. So uh, it depends on, on what you're working on. Not everything is going to be Watergate, you know, again. Um, so just be mindful that you have options and make those decisions based off of your quote unquote threat model. Carlo, you're the best. Thank you for that. It was really, really informative. Um, I, I think that the other three questions were the other, let's see. Um, two of the questions feel really technical to me. So maybe Harlow, if she doesn't mind, might just type, type an answer to the folks who are, if it's an easy one, I feel like they might be technical enough that okay. it's hard yeah. for other folks to follow. Um, <laughs> I like the one about this laser microphone. Um, I do, <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'll type the answer, but I want everyone to hear about um, laser microphones that allow eavesdropping through walls at a distance of up to 400 meters and windows up to 100 meters. And what can you do to protect yourself? Uh, what like scenario um, is best to protect yourself? And I think that this is an interesting question, especially because we're all working from home. And so like you can't, you can only do so much um, when you're working from home. You don't necessarily have like the ability to move to like, you know, an anonymous cafe or check into a hotel or whatever, which is like what Ellsberg did when working on the Pentagon Papers. Like those days are over. What do you do? 
<laughs> um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it might be a little bit beyond the scope of what we want to talk about, but I'm more than happy if you ping me um, offline to answer those questions. All right. Well, I feel like we have covered the questions. Um, we covered the core material. I think we, we're not going to have time to delve in any depth into social media settings. So I feel like it's probably better if we save that for another time. Um, I just want to thank Harlow for doing this with me. If Harlow wants thank to. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Um, if Harlow wants to drop any answers into the very, very specific questions, she can. Otherwise, it might make sense for folks to, to reach out to her directly. Um, I don't know if uh, folks from New America have anything they wanted to add as we wrap up, but. Harlow, is there a way to contact you or a way that you would recommend panels contact or participants contact you if you, they have any further questions? Yes. Um, we are at Freedom of the Press Foundation, so freedom.press, and I'm Harlow, H-A-R-L-O, at freedom.press. Thanks, Harlow. Great. Right, that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much for the wonderful session today. This event will be uploaded to YouTube within 24 hours after the event ends. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.